Hi Grade Sixes, welcome to a new time, a time where we'll be putting our ukuleles down for a moment so that we can go back into the past and see from whence the music that we currently listen to came from. So whether we are in Asia, whether we're in America, whether we're in Kenya or South America, most of the music that we currently listen to in this current age came from a very similar spot. We call it Western civilization. The Western world mainly comprises of the Europeans and then eventually um, cause the Americans because the Europeans moved to America, they colonized there and the Americans also have had a huge influence over the music that we currently listen to. So what we'll be focusing on is a lot of Western music. So that's the classical music, the Baroque music, the romantic music, and trying to understand how it evolved to become what it became and how it is that we're listening to it right now and seeing the similarities of these different eras versus also our current 21st century era. So make sure you have a notebook and pen so that you can jot down all the things I'm talking about and so that you won't have to keep coming back to the video to remember what I said. Although the video will still be there to see what I said, but really try and write it down so it really sticks in your mind. So go grab a pen and go grab a paper or a notebook, whatever you would not lose in the next one day. So to start off, we have five major eras. We have the Renaissance, we have the Baroque, we have the Classical, we have the Romantic, and then we have the 20th century era. So we're going to start off by looking at the Baroque era. So before the Baroque was the Renaissance era, and that was from 1400 to 1600. But the Baroque era was now for the next 150 years, from 1600 to the year 1750. That means it was from the 17th century to mid 18th century. Now, how do you find out what century specific things were in? So if you were in the 18th century, all you do is you subtract one. So what I mean is if you're in the 18th century, what's 18 minus one? 17. So the 18th century is from the 1700s all the way till the 1800s. The 19th century, what do you do? Subtract one. The 19th century was from the 1800s to the 1900s and so on. So for example, if I'm saying the 15th century, it doesn't mean from the year 1500. No, it means from the year 1400 to the year 1500. So make sure you always subtract one and you know how to figure out the years within a century. So currently we're in the 21st century, meaning we're in the year 2000s because 21 minus one is 20. So we're in the year 2000s, okay? So to start off with the Baroque era, it begins in a town in Italy called Florence, whereby a group of intellectuals would constantly come together and meet up and discuss different ideas. This particular group was called the Florentine Camerata, and they were, this, they were rich people and they were very intellectual, and the people who were high in society at that time. So they were well educated and they knew a lot about philosophy, art, music, architecture. They were the creme de la creme of the land. And alongside these intellectuals, were artists, writers, and musicians. Not the same way people think that, oh, writers and musicians are not too smart. No, that's not true. Our writers and musicians have a lot, especially in influencing the way a person thinks and influencing the way a culture thinks. And the philosophy of the people within the Florentine Camerata was that music was a powerful tool that could be used to induce emotion, that could be used to arouse emo emotion, especially if it was similar to the music of the ancient times, specifically the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans. So they felt the more you could go back in time and replicate the ancient Greek and Roman music, the better the music would be able to arouse the emotions within you. So that was their philosophy, that music was a powerful tool in communication that could arouse emotion in its listeners, especially if it emulated ancient Greek or Roman music. The only problem was they felt that music at the time of the Renaissance had become completely corrupted and it was so complicated. There was no distinct emotion. Things were everywhere. This now brings us into a specific aspect of music called music texture. I want you to be able to understand three different kinds of musical textures. We have monophony, we have polyphony, and we have homophony. So starting off with monophony, this is just a single melody. This is someone just singing a simple line. So like da 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 da. And imagine like even if you have a hundred people singing that same melody, it is still one melody. That is called monophony. Polyphony is when you have multiple melodies, more than one, poly meaning many, more than one melody happening at the exact same time. So it's like if I'm talking like this and then someone else starts like this and then someone else starts coming and then someone else starts coming like this and then someone else starts coming and then one more person comes. All of a sudden there's a lot of people, a lot of things going on. 
And sometimes it can become a little bit hard to distinguish what is going on, especially when you have a lot of people talking. And that's polyphony, when you have one melody but other melodies at the same time playing together. So poly meaning many melodies at the same time. Mono meaning one, only one melody at the same time. And it doesn't matter how many people sing that one melody, it does, it's only one melody, so it remains monophonic. The third aspect is homophony. Homophony is kind of what we've been doing with the ukulele, whereby there's a melody, someone is playing the melody line, and the other person is holding the harmony. And how are they holding the harmony? With chords. So that was mainly popularized in the classical era, whereby you'd have a person on the piano holding the, the harmony on the left hand, those are the chords, and then playing a melody on the right hand. For us, since we're playing ukulele or guitar, we play someone is one person is playing those chords, the other person is playing the melody on top. So that is homophonic music, okay? So monophonic, we have single melody, doesn't matter how many people sing it, if it's the same melody, it's monophonic. Polyphonic, multiple melodies at the same time. And then we have homophonic, that is melody and chords at the same time, melody and harmony. Chords are harmony, okay? So, the Baroque era was mainly in the second category. They were main, mainly polyphonic. However, it, this brings us back to the problem the Florentine Camaratas had with the Renaissance era. So the problem the Florentine Camaratas had with the Renaissance era music was that firstly, it caused music to become totally unintelligible, meaning people could not really understand what was going on because of all the polyphony that was used. It was an overuse of polyphony. Polyphony was still used in the Baroque era, but not as much as it was in the Renaissance era. So that was the first problem, an overuse of polyphony. The second problem was an overuse of this technique called counterpoint. And don't worry too much about what counterpoint is. It's kind of like polyphony as well. Technically, it is polyphony. Counterpoint is polyphony. But the second problem they had is the polyphony slash counterpoint really muddled the affetto. Affetto means the affection of the music. And therefore, a reaction couldn't really be derived from the listener. So you just be listening to the music and you have no idea what's going on. It's unintelligible. The second of all, you're not feeling anything. A lack of affetto. So... Those were the two main problems they had with the Renaissance era. Their solution was simple. Let's simplify the music. By bringing a form of simplicity, now people can be able to understand what is going on and um, emotions can be aroused from the listeners, which were particularly them. And also they were the writers of the music. So they had a problem with the Renaissance era that lasted the for 200 years and their solution was let's simplify the music. Let's not get rid of polyphony, but let's make it a bit more understandable to the listeners. So just for a little bit of history so we can understand what Baroque actually means. Baroque is derived from a Portuguese term, Barocco. And what it means is an oddly shaped pearl. Because you know, pearls are supposed to be nice, round and smooth. But many a time, you can find a pearl that has a slight deformity in its form. So when the Baroque music started being formed, it got its term from this irregular shaped pearl because it was not something that people were used to hearing and it was something new. And also something that still gets a bit more attention because of how odd it looks amidst all the other things that are regularized, amidst all the other things that look exactly the same. If you find everyone is wearing a black suit and then so someone is wearing a black suit, but then all of a sudden they have a pop of pink on their bow tie, you'll notice them a little bit more. And that is why it was called Barocco, an oddly shaped pearl. Music during the time of the Renaissance was mainly found in sacred spaces. Sacred meaning the church. Wherever the church was, that's where you'd find the musicians. The musicians mainly belonged to the church and they were making a lot of sacred music. When the Baroque era was being ushered in, there was a shift that was beginning from the end of the Renaissance era to the Baroque. It's never like a distinct stop here. All right, no more church music, now we'll start making music for this era. No, it's always like a bit of a blur. There's a nice blend that always goes on and things grow. It's never just a distinct start and a distinct stop. So music started gaining dominance in the secular spaces. So sacred was church, secular was just in the world. So that meant that you did not have to go to church anymore to hear music. You could just, you could hear it in an opera house. Various Baroque showcases would be had. But for the Baroque era, it was still mainly for the elitists, the people who were rich and wealthy, who were able to afford to go listen to specific musicians play, perform their pieces. This, there was also the beginning of instrumental music. Instrumental music whereby there did not have to be a voice. Renaissance music 
was very heavy in vocal music, meaning people were always singing along with the music that was there. But when the Baroque era came, now you could just hear a violin and you would listen to the whole violin for a whole two hours. It was just the instrument and that's what instrumental music is. So instrumental music became more popularized. And also in the Baroque era, a very significant thing, we had the creation of the first operas. We had Daphne and Eurydice by Jacopo Peri. These were the first operas created, and they were created right at the beginning of the Baroque era, within the years 1598 to 1600. Remember, the Baroque era was from 1600 to 1750. So, a couple of characteristics about the Baroque era. Firstly, we had our three musical textures, our monophonic, our polyphonic, and our homophonic. The Baroque era was mainly polyphonic. Even though they tried to step away from the Renaissance era that had used an excessive amount of polyphony, they still had some poly polyphony. And that was a very major characteristic of Baroque music, having multiple melodic lines playing with each other. Make sure you understand that, the, the difference between those three textures. They also had the use of contrasts, whereby there was dynamic. You didn't just have music that was soft, the entire way through. You'd have a piece that went from soft to loud, back down to soft again. And you'd have solos whereby you have one instrumentalist playing for most of the time. Or you have ensembles whereby you have multiple instruments, instrumentalists playing together. So when we're doing some of our stuff on ukulele, when it's you performing by yourself, it's a solo. When it's you and your partner performing together, it is an ensemble, specifically a duet. If we added one more person, it becomes a trio. We add one more person, it becomes a quartet. We add one more person, it becomes a quintet and so on. And that really became popularized within the Baroque era. The third characteristic that really defined the Baroque era was the use of this technique called basso continuo. And what that means is a continuous bass. And it is pretty much the same as someone holding a chord and you're making a harmonic foundation. You're defining the basis upon which all melodies will be played. I hope that's not too complicated because the more you play your music, you will be able to understand that. If you change a chord, whoever's playing the melody will sound slightly different with every chord that is put as the basis. So if you play in C major it, and someone is playing a melody on top of that, it will sound different when you're playing a G major and they're playing the same melody. If you're playing an A minor and they're playing the same melody, if you're playing an F and they're playing the same melody, there will be different colors, there will be different feelings and different sounds that come out of that because of a mixing of that. So basso continuo was having just a bass. You know in a band we have the bass, the bassist who is holding down those foundations. Now he doesn't necessarily hold chords, but he still holds a note that is strong enough for the melodies and everything to rest upon. So basso continuo became popularized within the Baroque era, mainly having two instruments. We had the harpsichord. Now this is just, let's pause right here. The harpsichord is the grandfather of the piano. But before the harpsichord in the Renaissance era, we had another version called the clavichord. Now the clavichord gave rise to the harpsichord. And the harpsichord doesn't necessarily work like a piano. Actually, it doesn't work like a piano. If you've ever opened a piano, you see that there's a hammer and it's hitting the strings. So a piano is actually not a string instrument. It is a percussion instrument because there is a contact between a hammer and strings. Now the harpsichord, which was the, before the piano, was a different mechanism. It had a plucking mechanism whereby when you press a note, it plucks on the string. So twang, 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 twang. So that's the difference between a harpsichord and a piano. Harp, piano hitting on the strings, harpsichord plucking on the strings. So the basso continuo would have either just the harpsichord because you could use both hands to play the left side which would be the bass and the right side which would be the melody or it could also just have the harpsichord another accompanying bass instrument like a cello the fourth characteristic was also the use of counterpoint and this like i said counterpoint is very similar to polyphony it is having multiple melodic lines playing at the same time it means like point on point there's another melody matching another melody at just a different note, all right? So don't worry too much about that, but make sure you understand that. Two very important characteristics are basso continuo and counterpoint. The fifth major characteristic of Baroque era music was they were trying to make one distinct emotion. They were trying to outline one distinct emotion throughout the piece, not multiple emotions like was happening in the Renaissance era. One emotion throughout the piece and let that be from beginning to the end. Obviously there were times where they could vary the emotions a bit, but that delves a bit more within the classical era where they would have a bit more going on emotionally. Baroque era, mainly one emotion, let's define throughout the piece. Want to make it sad, let's have a different piece. Another major factor, which is our sixth characteristic, was they were connecting the text to the music. 
the lyrics of the song mattered. No longer was it just random words that would play to some instruments in the background. No, the, the text matched the music. So if it was a happy song, then we'd be talking about everything that, that is pleasant and pleasing to us as humans. But if it was a sad song, we would talk about all the things that bring us sorrow and the music would match that. So the text were matching the song. The lyrics were matching the song. Seventh characteristic of Baroque music, the presence of virtuosos. A virtuoso was someone who was extremely skilled, both technically, harmonically, they were the best of the best when it came to music. And in the Baroque era, we had a lot of virtuosos. They were extremely skilled people. So even though the point of the Baroque era was to simplify the music, the pieces were still technically demanding. They were very technically advanced and they still are to this day. So don't be fooled that because they simplified it, it's easier to play. No, it was, it was simplified in its ability to arouse emotion within the listeners, but in its ability to play, it was way more advanced. The eighth characteristic of the Baroque era was the fact that operas had now begun. The prevalence of operas. Operas were now getting into the musical scene and what's crazy is they're still here today. Can you imagine that? From 1600s all the way up until 2020 wherever, there's still operas going on and it started in the Baroque era. One last characteristic, you can call it the ninth characteristic, but I, I would actually say it's the main characteristic of the Baroque era and it was both present in art, architecture, music, everything. It was the fact that the Baroque era was extremely extravagant. They were extremely dec decadent. They were extremely decorated in every aspect from whether it's the art to the music. When it came to art, it was extremely decadent. It was extremely decorated and extremely elaborate. Some of those pieces are still there today. One very good example in regards to architecture was the Palace of Versailles, which is in France. If you ever get a chance to go to France, it is one of the things you have to look at, including La, La Louvre, which has the Mona Lisa. But definitely go check out the Palace of Versailles. Extremely well decorated and it's a very good example of the very elaborate architecture that happened within the Baroque era. Another good example when it comes to very elaborate art is some sacred pieces that were made in the Baroque era are currently being kept in the Saint Basilica in the Vatican City. So you, if you get a chance to go to the Vatican City and you get to go to, into the Saint Basilica, you will see on the roofs a lot of very elaborate art and that is from the Baroque era. But now when it came to music, the way they decorated and the way the Baroque era really sh showed itself within music was the melodic lines. They were very elaborate and they just kept going, they kept going, they kept going and kept going. So everything was just decorated. So that is one of the biggest points I want you to remember for the Baroque era. It was an extremely decorated era, both in art, both in architecture, both in music. You can use the words elaborate, decorated, decadent, extravagant. All of those are perfect descriptive words to describe the Baroque era. Now, when it came to music in the Baroque era, we still had the prevalence of the instruments that were there from the Renaissance era, but some of the instruments that we currently have actually created them. One very important one being the violin, which was created in the early 18th century, when is the 18th century? Subtract one, the 1700s. And it was created by Antonio Stradivari. And his violins are called the Stradivarius violins. And currently to this day, they are worth millions of dollars. So Antonio Stradivari designed the first violin within the 18th century. And they're still there today, just way more than the average person can afford. The next big invention was the piano forte. Now the piano forte was the piano that came before the piano that we currently know. So piano forte. And it was created by a person called Bartolomeo Cristofore. And the reason he created it was he was unsatisfied with the harpsichord's dynamics. When I talk about dynamics, I mean how soft can you get versus how loud can you get? So he was unsatisfied because the harpsichord was pretty flat lined when it came to dynamics. It was just the same amount of volume. Volume is another way to understand dynamics. So he wanted to create something which could have soft sounds and louder sounds. And so he ended up creating the piano forte, which was one of the prototypes before the piano actually became the piano that we know today. And we'll, we'll see that later on. So remember that two important instruments, the piano forte by Bartolomeo Cristofore and the violin by Antonio Stradivari. And both of them made right about the same time in the early 18th century. Now, some of the instruments that we still had within the Baroque era was the cello, the viola. The cello was very popularized because a lot of the cello music we have today was written by Bach and Bach was within the Baroque era. 
And then we also had the double bass. So those are our string instruments. We have the violins, the violas, the cellos, the double bass. And those were created within the Baroque era. Within our woodwinds, we had our recorders, we had our oboe. What was once known as the shawm became the oboe later on. The shawm was in the, was in the Renaissance era, the oboe was in the Baroque era. So we had our recorders, we had our oboes, the bassoon, the wooden flute. When it goes to the next family of brass, we had our trumpets. Most of the remaining brass instruments come much later on, especially in the Romantic era, when a lot of industrialization was taking place and there was a better ability to create mechanical things. So don't worry about that for now. Just remember the only, the main brass instrument in the Baroque era was the trumpet. When it came to percussion, we had the harpsichord, which was the grandfather. You can call it the father or the grandfather, but just remember the piano forte was there before the piano. So if you look, you can look at it as the grandfather of the piano or the father of the piano. Okay, but our percussion instrument was the harpsichord, which was the main, one of the main instruments at that time, and the timpani, which was being used to really cause a nice rumble, a nice stir in the percussion realm. So those four families, strings, woodwind, brass, and percussion. Make sure you know the instruments that were there within the Baroque era. Lastly, we need to know some of our composers within the Baroque era. Some very prolific names, which you most definitely know, are Johann Sebastian Bach, one of the most prominent players within the Baroque era. Antonio Vivaldi, who composed The Four Seasons and is still listened to and played to today. George Friedrich Handel, who was a German composer. And Claudio Monteverdi, who was an Italian composer. So as you can see, for the Baroque era, we had German composers, which is Handel. You had Claudio Monteverdi, who was an Italian. You had Sebastian Bach, who was also a German. You had Antonio Vivaldi, who was Italian. They're also French composers. There are also some Spanish composers. There were many composers just within Europe, but that comes down within the classification of westernization that, that is western music so right there that's a lot of information when it comes to the baroque era but very vital especially when we're trying to understand how it flows into the next era which is a classical era and when it flows into the era after that which is our romantic era and then finally the one that is closest to the, the one that we know is the 20th century but we're not going to get there just yet firstly understand the context of the baroque era so that it can lay a good foundation for when we now bring in our composers so i've attached a few links in the description that i want you to take a look at some of them are very short mainly talking about the three musical textures the monophony the polyphony and the homophony. So take a chance to look at it so you can further deepen your understanding of those musical textures. And also I've attached some Baroque pieces that you can listen to, especially if you're studying or if you have nothing better to do and you're tired of the current music you're listening to. Take some time to listen to this Baroque music, but you don't have to listen to that whole thing. Some of them can be really long, some of them are really short, but the point is really familiarize yourself with this Baroque music, okay? So make sure you have a good understanding of the whole of the Baroque era and it will lay a good foundation for now when I bring in the different composers. We're only going to look at a few composers at a time within each era before moving on to the next era. So really familiarize yourself with the characteristics and the general layout of that historical situation so that we can better understand why the composers wrote what they wrote and what really influenced their music at that time. All right, grade sixes, I hope you've enjoyed understanding the Baroque era and I will see you soon for our first Baroque composer.